For the next several days, Maxwell Air Force Base will be getting national attention as 25 legendary greats of aviation history meet at the base for a program called the Gathering of Eagles. The aviator's experience spans from World War I all the way to the space shuttle. The Gathering of Eagles is also a sanctioned event of the Air and Space Bicentennial. Students at Air Command and Staff College designed this year's program and also arranged for its funding by selling lithographs signed by the aviators. Lieutenant Colonel David McFarlane is a man who originally dreamed up the Gathering of Eagles. He's already put on two similar programs at Maxwell. He says the Gathering of Eagles is in keeping with Project Warrior, an Air Force program designed to remind servicemen about the mission of the Air Force. Uh, most of the younger officers in the Air Force now have or have limited combat experience and pretty soon will be at the point where there will be no combat experience. So we feel that we need to go back and draw on the experience of the people, you know, in the past. Two of the living legends arrived today. America's greatest living ace from World War I and a top ace from Finland during World War II. This marks the third time Colonel George Vaughn has been in Montgomery to take part in the Living Legends program. He says it's nostalgic. I've been interested in uh, military aviation ever since it started in World War I. So the uh, closer I keep to it, the more at home I feel. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. I know a good many people here, and we have good friends. And we just enjoy coming back. What? I give to you the governor of the state of Alabama. You live in a fine country, and you're going to have to show the responsibilities of having stay intact and be a first na class nation. United States. Thank you very much. Since the early 1930s, Alabama voters have been restricted to one of two standard types of voting machines. But the 1983 Election Reform Act recently passed by the legislature is changing all that. The state is now looking at several new types of electronic voting machines. They're lightweight, fast, and their makers claim they're extremely accurate. We've simply opened Alabama law up to competition. Before, we were relegated to buying this out-of-date, these technological dinosaurs, which were expensive to buy, expensive to maintain. They weighed 900 pounds, 20,000 movable parts, and they tended to break down on election day, and they scared everybody when you walked in. The new machines are said to be cheaper to buy, cheaper to store, and easier for voters to use, and that might help cut long lines at polling places. I think that uh, voters themselves will, will find the equipment interesting enough to attract their attention and maybe produce a, a, a higher voter turnout. But Other states have been using electronic voting machines for years. If all goes as planned, some counties in Alabama that can afford the new machines might start using them in time for this fall's legislative elections. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. For governor in this size block, for governor in that size block, whatever it may be. That's a write in, I can hit the write in. All right, but now I suppose somebody comes back over here and punches one. Yes. Yes. Computer reads the cartridge and adds the total for the up. Simple method, turning this over, opening up the doors.
machines are similar to Pac-Man, only they allow the player to accumulate points by the number of games he wins. But authority says after he's completed his round, the bartender checks the score and pays accordingly. Investigators have confiscated seven machines in Montgomery, several at lounges on Bell Street on Montgomery's west side. Authorities say the odds are 100% in favor of the house in the games that began appearing in Alabama about three months ago. Investigative sources say players can win up to $600 if the right number of points is accumulated. An FBI report made public in May says it is believed that organized crime may be connected to the gambling video, and police sources in Indiana may be trying to confirm that. Indiana appears to be the source of the gambling video, with Montgomery, Prattville, and Selma listed in intelligence reports as major distribution and repair centers for the machines. One Montgomery businessman who leases video game machines says his regular customers have been inquiring about the video gambling machines. He says he tells them he will not be involved in video gambling. The businessman who asked not to be identified added that he'd noticed no loss of revenue to the video gambling games. But TV 12 News has learned that several legitimate video game leasing agents did complain to authorities about the gambling several months ago before the raids were executed at two local night spots several weeks ago. Indictments on gambling charges are being considered by several local law enforcement agencies in connection with the illegal video machines, and more raids are expected. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News reporting. This is a video conference telecast to all Holiday Inns across the country over ACSN Cable Network. It's designed to inform all hotel employees of the upcoming changes in store for Holiday Inns. Some of those changes include new, smaller outdoor signs, renovated rooms with new decor, Holodex 2 computerized reservation systems, and HBO in-room movies at no extra cost. Why is Holiday Inn doing all this to keep up with the Hiltons and the Marriotts? Well, not necessarily, according to Holiday Inn general manager Myers Baxter. Or you don't feel any big competition that way? No, uh, we're still number one and the leader in that field. We intend to stay there. Holiday Inn has always prided itself on being a leader in motel accommodations that aren't too expensive and not cheap either. But now with this new campaign, Holiday Inn is going after the higher income traveler as well as those who don't want to spend much. Mr. Baxter says a ritzier hotel to be called Crown Plaza is in the works and plans are being considered for a lower priced hotel as well. Mr. Baxter says Holiday Inn's continued growth is phenomenal. Gina Gregory, WSFA TV News. Votes cast and others, you might have a few less, depending on the interest in the race. When will Mr. Jordan carry that type of the, Yes, the indictment alleges that uh, Maddie T. William Burris voted in Detroit, Michigan at all. The indictment further alleges that Jordan mailed fraudulent absentee voter affidavits bearing the names of 16 purportedly qualified voters, seven of which actually lived outside of the state of Alabama and three of which actually voted in another state on November the 2nd, 1982. Could be sentenced to imprisonment for up to 85 years and could be fined up to $26,000. The indictment is the result of a comprehensive investigation conducted jointly by the United States Attorney. Well, let's see. The knee bone is connected to the foot bone, and the hand bone is connected to the Chevy. Wait a second, that's only if you're taking part in the Kidney Foundation's Touch a Chevy Marathon. This is a test of endurance and character and good luck to every one of you. We appreciate you. These kids don't want to let go of the Chevys. The last person holding on gets to drive away with a 1983 Camaro. Now, if you're a betting person, you'd put your money on one of the female contestants. Organizers say women tend to win these marathons. They didn't say why. Do the men here agree with that? Do you think that women have a better chance of winning this than we do? Thank you. They speak for themselves. Men, women do not have the endurance enough to stay on this car for three days. But you do. Right. The Kidney Foundation will try to wrap up the marathon in about 72 hours. If it's looking too easy, the judges have a few positions up their sleeves. They will probably go even as possibly to one foot and put their other foot up on the bumper, and it will be hard to hold that for four hours, I imagine. <laughs> I just hope they don't tell me to stay in the position for four hours with my elbow on the car. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News.
scattering. In fact, I've determined that a speech of this kind should have at least three qualities. Very seldom will you be able to, like you, do it in a place like this. And he got up with his king, ambled to the lectern to present the national address. The changes in the ethics law considered by the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee were endorsed by the executive director of the Ethics Commission, Melvin Cooper. The major change approved was to bring under the code of ethical conduct everyone paid fully or in part by public money, regardless of the amount. The present law only covers those public officials and employees who make more than $15,000 a year. Under another bill approved, only those who make $20,000 or more a year need file financial disclosure statements. A companion bill voted out sets a maximum $1,000 fine for not filing. Committee members also approved a bill that would require candidates for local offices to file financial disclosure forms within 10 days of becoming a candidate. Candidates for state offices are already required to file. The Judiciary Committee gave a favorable report to a bill that would repeal a law that restricts the number of hazardous waste disposal sites in Alabama counties. A 1981 law provides that no more than one disposal site can be located in a county without prior legislative approval. The Judiciary Committee also approved a bill to prohibit telephone companies from monitoring conversations between customers and telephone employees. Union members complained that the phone companies were eavesdropping. A phone company executive says they monitor the conversations to ensure employees are giving out accurate information. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. According to Captain John Wilson, police officers answered two calls about shootings in the Tulane Court area around 9 o'clock last night. The calls turned out to be related. Captain Wilson says the officers on the scene were confronted by an armed black man on Smythe Circle. Captain Wilson says Officer L.T. Pugh ordered the suspect to drop his weapon, and he says the suspect leveled a shotgun at Pugh, and the officer fired, killing the suspect. The gun was recovered with a live round in the chamber and the hammer cocked. He leveled the gun at the police officers and we do not intend at this time or any time in the future for a police officer to go to a call and wait until he gets shot first before he returns fire. According to Captain Wilson, the dead man had already shot and wounded one man and fired shots at some juveniles. The wounded man was treated and released from St. Margaret's Hospital. The police say there are witnesses to both shootings. This is the second the fatal shooting of a black suspect in two weeks. Protection. This man didn't come down here looking for us. He was in the neighborhood and the officers went out there and were forced into a situation where it was either shoot or be shot. And that's the bottom line to it. Susan Silvernail, WSFA we TV don't have News. A for it at the time. We don't have any reason what sparred the shooting. Defensive play of the game came in the bottom of the fifth inning. Yankees Andre Robertson fly ball the right. Here comes Reggie Jackson. Shoestring catch and compliments from second baseman Bobby Gritch. He says, all right, Reggie. Yankees were hustling tonight on this wild pitch by Dave Goltz. Greg Nettles, who's on first, is around second. Hustling all the way, but his slide will cause him to be out. He never reached third base on the play. Bottom of the sixth inning. There's still no score in the game. That's Bobby Mercer of the Yankees, who sends this Goltz pitch into the right field bleachers. one nothing. It was Yankees on top. Still in the sixth with a runner on, Oscar Gamble on a 2-0 pitch into the nighttime air over Yankee Stadium. The Yankees shut out the California Angels 3 to nothing. I'm George Michael for NBC News. Survey as vice chairman at this meeting temporary and then at the next meeting we would elect the one. Would you do that? I was supposed to. Until we have reorganization elect another one. Uh, this morning, he was of course was on the selection committee, but he had to be out of the state. But I believe the selection. Well, let's see. I think we'll get that out of the way. Uh, I don't have any problem with Mr. Deagall or anybody else. Selection committee. <coughs> And we're hopeful and prayerful that things are going to be stabilized there. But another thing that I've been speaking American Legion, I even belong to the first post uh, organized in Paris. The fact that we do have an economic recession, but things are getting better. 
And there is hope. Alabama Girl State the past 40 years. ...of the world, such as down in Central America, and we have refugees that are fleeing over in Africa, South America, Central America, all of them are trying to... And that's exactly what I'm going to do today. But I want to say to your governor and the other officials of Girl State that you are being sponsored by the American Legion Auxiliary, which is one of the most patriotic organizations... Colonel Vaughn says when he went off to war, it was a different time and a different mood in America. He says no self-respecting Princeton student like himself would want to be caught walking down the street without a military uniform on. I have at home letters that I wrote to my family uh, when I was in uh, college. Uh, uh, nothing about worrying about whether I was not going to pass the examination or not. What I was worried about, I like, was going to pass, fail the physical exam to get into the Air Force. Colonel Vaughn was a member of the Princeton University Aero Club. And as he put it, the college thought it would be a fine idea to have a Princeton squad representing America in World War I. After a few months of combat training, he was flying over German lines. And on his first mission, he encountered a German plane. Half my tailplane was riddled with bullet holes before I even knew there was anybody shooting at me. <laughs> While his first combat flight was hair-raising, the one he remembers most is the time he was nearly shot down. Uh, when the gas tank was shot away, of course, the, uh, or the top was shot away, the, the engine stopped. And so uh, the only thing I could do was to spin down to the ground with no power and hope to find a place to land when I got there, even though we were on the German side at the time. So uh, I have home in my album today a, a picture of the German pilot who made out the combat report uh, indicating that he had shot me down. And uh, he really thought he had, and I thought he had too, as a matter of fact. But Colonel Vaughn says he was able to get his reserve tank going and return to base. The ace who chalked up 13 aerial victories during the war says now at age 86, his only flying is done as a passenger on commercial jets or with friends. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. That was closest I ever came to being shot down, I guess. Have you ever met? Residents of Tulane Court, where the shooting took place, say the events leading up to 62-year-old Raymond McDade's death started about a block and a half from his home. Witnesses say McDade became angry at some area residents who were leaning against his car. He had his gun out. He told him to get out this car. He got in the car. He rolled down the street, and he was shooting. Meanwhile, 43-year-old Solomon Porter, who says he was hit in the arm by one of McDade's shots, got a pistol from his car and shot back as McDade drove around the block. Neighbors say McDade shot at several young people near his home before Officer L.T. Pugh and two other officers arrived at McDade's apartment. They found him standing outside armed with a shotgun. The subject leveled a shotgun at Officer Pugh. Officer Pugh ordered the subject to drop the gun, identified himself as a police officer. At this time, he fired a series of shots fatally wounding one black male suspect. Police say the shotgun was loaded and cocked when McDade fell. Neighborhood residents say McDade often threatened people with a pistol and sometimes shot. Meanwhile, McDade's family is trying to figure out why it all happened. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. 62-year-old Raymond McDade's death came as a shock to his family. But Tulane court residents say he had often threatened people with a pistol and sometimes shot. And police say earlier this year, McDade was arrested for just that. Area residents say the shooting spree that led up to McDade's death last night apparently started because some people were leaning against his car. He went to his car. And he had his gun out. He told him to get out this car. He got in the car. He rolled down the street. And he was shooting. All the children had to get the children out of the way before he shoot one of them. 
43-year-old Solomon Porter, who was hit in the arm by one of McDade's bullets, fired back as McDade drove around the block to his nearby apartment. Police were told McDade fired at several young people across from his home before Officer L.T. Pugh and two other officers arrived. They found McDade armed with a shotgun. The subject leveled a shotgun at Officer Pugh. Officer Pugh ordered the subject to drop the gun, identified himself as a police officer. At this time, he fired a series of shots, fatally wounding one black male suspect. Police say the shotgun was loaded and cocked when McDade fell. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. Stoner's surrender was no surprise to Montgomery bail bondsman Sonny Kyle Livingston, who'd negotiated today's action by Stoner. Sonny Livingston is a friend of mine, and uh, since he's a friend of mine, I certainly did not want him to lose any bond money. Livingston right. says he wasn't worried. Mr. Stoner is a lawyer. He knows the procedures. He's no dummy. And I've always felt like he would turn himself in. Stoner appeared rested and relaxed when he talked with us, but he would not discuss where he'd been for 17 weeks. Uh, I, I can't say where I've been for the last uh, three or four months. The 59-year-old convicted bomber said he could have hidden for years without being caught. I, I could have stayed out. I could have stayed free for years and years because the FBI is not competent enough to, to find a, a man like me who can walk around and uh, limp around and, and still they can't find me. My policy was to stay away from everybody that I knew and, and that is one of the secrets that I can give anybody who wants to stay free whenever the Federal Bureau of Integration is looking for them. Some unidentified sources say J.B. Stoner's health caused him to turn himself in today, but he denied that and says he has at least one more legal remedy to gain his freedom from prison. Stoner says if his last legal appeal fails, he doesn't expect to survive a prison term no matter how short it is. He also says he doesn't expect to receive an early parole. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News at the Federal Courthouse. There is no advantage to me personally because I do not plan on seeking re-election as a council person. Uh, I think it gives the entire city of Montgomery an adequate opportunity to search around for alternative candidates to uh, the incumbent mayor, and uh, I would think that uh, uh, this puts his campaign at a serious disadvantage because the number of events are anticipated between now and October uh, 83 election date. subcommittee of this group met with the president of First Alabama Bank, asked him to make an apology to the community, and he said uh, emphatically that he would not apologize to the community, but that he had been misquoted and that he would send a letter. As of today, he has not sent a letter correcting the statements that were made saying that the black community had overreacted and that blacks were unfair to the Montgomery Police Department. Uh, would want our business. Uh, it's obvious at this point that First Alabama doesn't want the black community's business, and that was what uh, the decision was based on. No other bank has made statements such as the ones that were made by uh, the chief officer of the First Alabama Bank. And we're asking all blacks in the city of Montgomery who have been nominated or asked to serve to refrain from serving on that committee until such time as we can get some understanding as to a cooperative effort on behalf of the city government and the black community. For weeks, proponents of the Constitution, led by Senator Ryan DeGraffenreid of Tuscaloosa, have fought back amendment after amendment to the 63-page document. Some technical changes have been made, and an amendment was adopted, making education an essential function of state and local government. Perhaps the main haggling today was over an amendment that would dramatically change the makeup of the Board of Trustees at Auburn University. Senator Ted Little of Auburn wanted to, among other things, add six more trustees and make the Board of Trustees self-perpetuating. His amendment and several similar ones were voted down. Lieutenant Governor Bill Baxley let it be known that he wanted work on the Constitution to be finished today because he'll be out of town for the next two weeks at National Guard summer camp. When the vote did come, the Lieutenant Governor was pleased. I couldn't be happier. I don't think the Senate could have possibly done anything that have a longer benefit, longer range benefit to the people than what they did today. And uh, 
I think they did it in, a, in the, the correct way. They were deliberative. They spent a lot of time on it. They went over it word for word. The long bill still must pass the House, the governor, and a vote of the people. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. They were deliberative. They spent a lot of time on it. They went over it word for word. Uh, of course, Senator Graffenreid's due most of the credit, he and his committee, for that. Uh, but the whole Senate considered it. Uh, they voted some amendments in. They voted some things out. But uh, then when it came down to the final passage, it was, of course, an overwhelming vote, 31 to 1. And uh, I'm just proud uh, to be a, a small part of uh, the Senate on, on, when they do something like that. It could be said, if there was aerial combat near, so was Gabby Gerbreski. Shortly after Colonel Gerbreski graduated from flying school at Maxwell Field, he was sent to Hawaii. He was there when Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese. He was one of the first Americans transferred to England and flew with the Polish squadron of the Royal Air Force until more American supplies and men started arriving. If it appears that he was aggressive, that's good, because he says that's what makes fighter pilots. He can't be on a defense. He can't be a fighter pilot and be a fighter if you're going to be on a defensive looking behind your back and thinking that somebody's going to shoot you down. So you're aggressive, you keep your speed up and so forth, you do what you're supposed to do. But flying combat is no piece of cake no matter how many times you do it. It's controlled fear. If you have controlled fear, then you have sort of a rational approach to the subject matter or to the task or the mission. Another element that Colonel Grabreski took with him every time he climbed into a cockpit is the love and faith he has in America. I feel that every one of the individuals should be motivated to the point to feel that his generation is going to pick up the baton from the generation that preceded him to not only make America as good as it was, but even better. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. Well, it's now official, beginning with the 1984-85 school year, Alabama's high schools will be divided into six instead of the current four athletic classifications. And according to Athletic Association Executive Director Bubba Scott, it's a plan worth getting excited about. The six-class plan will give two more state champions in all the sports, and uh, the communities get real excited about uh, the championship programs. So we think that the communities are going to be more enthusiastic, and of course this excites me. Football and basketball will be the sports most affected by the new six-class plan. The number of teams qualifying for the playoffs will jump from the current 64 to 192. All this means more money, but exactly how much remains to be seen. Who's interested in more money? That's uh, the thing that keeps the program going. And uh, it will generate more money, we think. Yet I don't think that uh, that will be a great deal more. It will be more because it will be more games. Bubba, is this new six-class plan the best thing for Alabama high school athletics at this point? I think definitely it is the best thing at the present time, or the schools would not have voted 75% in favor of it. When you have a three-to-one vote, then uh, you know that your decision is, is solid and has the support of the vast majority of the schools. So yes, it is a very wise plan, and it, it is a good move for this association at this time. Rick Ponds, WSFA TV Sports.
I've been uh, enjoying life for the last few months, and uh, I, I wanted to enjoy life a little while longer before I die. Why did you decide to run, sir? Uh, several reasons. One is I wanted to live a little longer because uh, unless I can win justice in the federal courts, I will die in Alabama prisons because I am a white political prisoner. We have political prisoners in the United States, and I'm a white political prisoner here. And if the white people don't wake up and take back their rights, they'll end up not having any rights at all. Has there been any kind of a arrangement to have you serve your time in federal prison? No, no, sir. Where do you expect to be sent? To kill these? <coughs> I, I don't know for certain. Uh, can you tell us where you have been? I, I, I've been enjoying life recently. Have you been out of the country? I can't say where I have or have not been. Mr. Stoner, why did you decide to come back? Well, Sonny Livingston, my bondsman, is a friend of mine, and I didn't want him to lose $20,000. Okay. I might also say that we white people shall overcome. Why do you say that, Mr. Stoner? Because <coughs> the Antichrist Jews <clears throat> and the Jew-controlled NACP have taken rights away from us white people, and they've said they should overcome us. Well, we white people are going to be the ones to overcome Mr. Stoner, was it the uh, suit against your property and Marietta that uh, played a part? I don't have any personal property in Marietta. We whites shall still overcome. A subcommittee of this group met with the president of First Alabama Bank, asked him to make an apology to the community, and he said uh, emphatically that he would not apologize to the community, but that he had been misquoted and that he would send a letter. As of today, he had not sent a letter correcting the statements that were made, saying that the black community had overreacted and that blacks were unfair to the Montgomery Police Department. I wasn't going to apologize because I wasn't quoted correctly on it. I told him that I would contact the paper and I asked to have the thing corrected. Did you contact the paper? I did. I called. The chief executive officer of the sixth largest bank in the state is having trouble understanding why his bank has been targeted for a boycott. Mr. Gaskell says he was misquoted by a Montgomery newspaper and he tried to correct the mistake. I'm a little puzzled as to, as to what else I could do on that. I simply can't tell the newspaper what they're going to print and what they're not going to print. At this point, there seems to be no common ground on which black leaders and First Alabama Bank could meet. Uh, it's obvious at this point that First Alabama doesn't want the black community's business, and that was what uh, the decision was based on. I, I, I don't know what else I can tell them. I've already told them all I know. Uh, Bank officials say it's simply too early to judge the financial threat posed by the boycott. Mr. Gaskell wasn't aware of any withdrawals made today because of it. No, I just heard that the manager made some ugly remark about um, 
about something. I really haven't, haven't read about it. Mr. Gaskell thinks of the boycott not as a personal problem, but as a problem for the city of Montgomery, especially if it spreads to other businesses, as black leaders say it will. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. Mayor Falmer says the city has never tried to hurry up citywide elections, but disagreed with some council members who wanted the elections held next year, which would have extended their four-year terms to five years. The only thing we have ever opposed is the arbitrary extension of uh, the terms. We think that the citizens of Montgomery should have the right uh, to vote on their elected officials uh, without their terms being extended. The mayor used a meeting with reporters this morning to again say he'll be in the race for re-election and to present a collection of signatures from people he says will support him. Uh, those who think that, uh, uh, that there's not grassroots strength uh, for my candidacy of mayor uh, would, be, would like for them to come and peruse these uh, uh, petitions that we've had signed, which number, as I say, 17,345 registered voters in the city of Montgomery. As for current complaints of racial tensions in the city, the mayor says those have strengthened his campaign. Well, I hate for the racial issue to be an issue in the race, but others have made it so, not me. The mayor says black leaders' overreactions to events in the city are turning voters against them. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. in July. The Alabama Supreme Court ruling means all candidates who had already qualified for city elections in July will have to re-qualify for the October elections. And Mayor Emery Falmer will be among the candidates for re-election. The mayor says the city never tried to hurry up elections but disagreed with some council members who wanted elections next year because that would have extended their four-year terms in office to five years. The only thing we have ever opposed is the arbitrary extension of uh, the terms. While the whole dispute over the election date has been clouded by racial arguments, Mayor Falmer says he believes it has helped his campaign. Well, I hate for <clears throat> the racial issue to be an issue in the race, but others have made it so, not me. I think there is a, uh, a strengthening of my position uh, in the city of Montgomery uh, because of the excesses of uh, Mr. Watkins and Reed and Gilmore and Holmes. Uh, my count shows that 17,345 citizens of Montgomery uh, were uh, ready to uh, support my candidacy. These are, in fact, good times in Montgomery, according to the mayor, and he Washington says if black and white Gilmore leaders can get together, to they can be even better. Now, without cooperation, there will be no winners in the city of Montgomery. There will only be losers. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. Do you think that the uh, uh, that there would not be politics in the appointment of the 15 blacks that uh, would come from the community? Do you think that Mr. Reed, Mr. Watkins, Mr. Gilmore, Mr. Holmes, Mr. Knight would silently sit by and let uh, some uh, group of churches nominate citizens without their input? I certainly don't think that would be the case. As of this past Wednesday, the board had complied with every recommendation made by the examiners. As the 1983 graduating seniors marched inside to receive their long-awaited diploma, a sign outside read, Welcome Governor Baxley.
While he acknowledged that he may be addressing future state senators and governors, the lieutenant governor didn't hint to any future political plans. He didn't talk about state political problems, but rather world problems, the worst of which he says occur behind the Iron Curtain. They know they're unhappy. They're not even free to talk about the problems they have, or much less read about them in a free press or hear about them on a free news broadcast. So sometimes we get too preoccupied with what we've got and the problems we've got to appreciate how much better off we are than people anywhere else. Despite the world's problems, Mr. Baxley also talked about solutions, saying every problem has a solution, though finding one may not be easy. After the diplomas were awarded to about 400 graduates, TSU officials gave Mr. Baxley his, an honorary doctorate of law degree. University officials say that degree comes with acknowledgment from Time magazine that Mr. Baxley is recognized as one of 200 men expected to give new leadership in this country. Mr. Baxley makes no secret that he hopes to put that new leadership to work in Alabama in 1986. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News in Troy. Whatever problems and issues there are in this state are tied to the total failure of the legislative system to operate. And until we change that, we're not going to be able to address these problems. Lieutenant Governor Bill Baxley says writing a new constitution for the state is the first step toward eliminating the shortcomings plaguing the legislature. A proposed constitution passed the Senate this week and was sent to the House of Representatives. But Mr. Baxley says the Senate has done some modernizing of its own rules, too. Well, the Senate made some. Uh, this time, a lot of people uh, it didn't get the press coverage that uh, it should have, really, because they made some substantial. They gave up some of their power. They changed the number of senators it took to cut off a filibuster. You see, they cut it down from uh, 24 required to 21. Another change has been an increase in the number of standing Senate committees, but some senators say it's hard to attend all the extra committee meetings. I think the answer is not cutting back on committees. I think the answer is, is a little better planning and coordination on your scheduling. Generally, the lieutenant governor has praise for members of the legislature, but he says they're handicapped. I'd like to see uh, next year uh, some provision made for a new legislative building where these people would have offices, where they could have uh, secretarial help available to them, where they'd have staff help to advise them better and under better physical conditions than what they've got now. Another project Lieutenant Governor Baxley plans for next year is a change in the Budget Act, so lawmakers and everyone else will have a chance to know more specifically how the state plans to spend more than a billion dollars in tax money. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News, at the Capitol. Uh, I just sort of took a few minutes and counseled my Heavenly Father, I guess you'd say, and I just, you know, I felt I need to do something. With that, Colonel Fisher guided his A-1 SPAD to a makeshift runway that was too short for his plane to land. I hit a bunch of stuff and braked and skidded and braked. And, and when I got to the end, the brakes were red hot and still I couldn't stop it. Colonel Fisher finally brought his plane to a stop in a field and taxied back to where his friend's plane went down. And when I passed him, and then he jumped up. and They were pretty close to him. They got, he said, within 20 feet of him. Colonel Fisher had to cut the power on the plane, jump out, and help his friend into the cockpit. Under fire from the North Vietnamese, just yards from his location, Colonel Fisher gunned the engine and got the bullet riddled plane off the ground. We were just elated. We hugged each other. Uh, he stunk like the Dickens. He was burnt, and uh, his eyes, eyebrows were singed off, and he was blistered. And, but just we just hung on. Colonel Fisher was awarded the Medal of Honor for his action, but while he received a hero's welcome, he's concerned about the welcome other servicemen from Vietnam received. Uh, yeah, it was kind of an insult, uh, and to me, uh, I don't, I didn't recognize anything firsthand. Uh, I know fellows that you know were spit on; uh, they were, they gotten people beat up on them, and just because they were veterans. Colonel Fisher says Americans are already changing their attitude toward Vietnam vets. He says that's good, and hopes it will continue. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. There's no reason to, to treat people like that. Uh, uh, maybe the philosophy was wrong. Maybe. Lieutenant Sakai says his trip to America is a dream come true. It's been a time to reflect on his military service and to talk with men he did combat with during World War II. Lieutenant Sakai was one of the most feared Japanese fighter pilots in the sky, gaining more than 64 aerial victories. The mission the Japanese ace is most asked about is the time he was nearly shot down by eight Navy dive bombers he mistook for fighters. He remembers it vividly. 
canopy of quiet about me. Sakai's daughter, who was serving as his translator, says he thought he was going to die after he was shot. Sakai says while his plane was headed to the sea, he saw his life flash before his eyes and felt a strange kinship for the three American pilots he had shot down earlier that day. And he felt as if he is talking, talking to the pilot he killed, telling them, I'm coming to you. That, that's what he felt. It was a very strange feeling that he said. Sakai snapped out of his days and his dive after he heard his mother calling to him, urging him to go on with his life. Partially paralyzed, bleeding and blinded in one eye from the rounds he took, he finally returned to his base 600 miles away. After Japan surrendered, Sakai was destitute. He called his days following the war a bitter struggle, far worse than anything he had known in combat. Sakai says he harbors no bad feelings for America or Japan. He says he was confused and amazed by the American occupation troops. He said they did one thing Japan had been trying to do all along, feed the people of his country. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. The gathering of eagles at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery is one of more than 50 aviation and aerospace events which will take place during 1983, the Air and Space Bicentennial. 25 aviation heroes from World War I aces to astronauts have been in Montgomery since Thursday to swap old war stories and celebrate the 200th anniversary of manned flight. Astronaut Joe Engel, who commanded the Columbia Space Shuttle in 1981, said he felt it was an honor for him to be able to talk with his fellow aviation heroes for the past three days. This, uh, this thing that you've heard about, or we've all read about, this camaraderie among pilots, uh, this deep feeling of, of uh, brotherhood among pilots, by God, it's real. There's nothing phony about it. The gathering of eagles coincided with graduation at the U.S. Air Force Command and Staff College in Montgomery. The legendary aviators said they enjoyed meeting the aviators of the future. I've never seen anything more satisfactory, as far as I'm concerned, than the present of uh, ability, morale, capability, training, uh, uh, just generally, uh, these current uh, uh, Air Force organizations represent the best there is in the, in the youth of today. Colonel Vaughn said he didn't believe high unemployment was the reason so many young people are signing up for the military. He said renewed patriotism and the military's extensive advertising campaign were helping to bring in recruits. Lisa Walsh, WSFA TV News. I have been involved in the dilemma, which we do well, therefore, to note that there are really only three that I remote posterity. And Dr. Wesley has pointed out that through an unfortunate combination of circumstances and events, and that today, I will simply say that you graduates are students at an institution which is and was a part of a great movement which surged upward after the Civil War. It was and is a living, tangible movement of men and women of African heritage who in their newly won freedom understood the urgency of education and of justice. And now we have to ask, what has happened to that vision and that urgency? For there is still a tradition of justice to be refined and honed. Alabama's Democrats are getting a lot of attention this year from the many Democratic presidential hopefuls. 
One reason is that Alabama's presidential primary next spring will be one of the earliest in the country. And presidential contenders like South Carolina's Fritz Holling say that means Alabama will be an early indicator of how successful their campaigns are. Alabama's concerned about jobs, just like we all are over the entire country. Now, what a man will do in public office is best told by what he's done. Performance is better than promise. Mr. Hollings is relying on his more than 30 years experience in government to attract voters. The question is, will that be enough to set him apart from the many other candidates and win Alabama's Democratic support? These men or any one of them is just going to have to excite the people or stir people's imaginations or make people realize that they understand exactly what needs to be done. I'm not just worried about whether or not Reaganomics works and we have some slight recovery. You're bound to have some recovery in the cyclical basis of emptying out all the warehouses, putting everybody on unemployment. There's bound to come a demand and some slight recovery, but our concern is whether it'll be a true turnaround, whether it'll be a lasting recovery. One thing, though, that Mr. Hollings and many other Democrats agree upon, whoever gets the Democratic nomination will need strong support to beat President Reagan should he run for re-election. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. And Precious name. might bow there and ask that God would help us to obtain justice and a right to live yes. Yes. in this land of the free, my Lord, my Lord. home of the brave. Well, my Lord. Lord. The marchers carried two symbolic coffins. The president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference says they're a reminder you fall the police have done something that can't be undone. Uh, any officer that uses a uh, firearm carelessly, irresponsibly, or viciously must be reminded that, that the, re the result is so final because we've got to impress the community that it, it's all of our responsibility to, to have a police department that's responsible, that exercises uh, the, the utmost care in the use of firearms. Dr. Lowry believes the Rousseau brothers might be alive today if the laws on using deadly force were tougher and if politicians were held accountable to a large black electorate. 
That is why the marchers will stop in seven cities in southeast Alabama this week and encourage black citizens to register to vote. Dr. Lowry says blacks must elect officials who won't tolerate such police actions. trip to Abbeville for the first voting rights rally was interrupted by a stop at a small Baptist church. This is where the Rousseaus were buried almost two months ago. The marchers laid wreaths at the brothers' grave site. Dr. Lowry told the group, quote, we must see to it that they haven't died in vain. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. salute Chris Everett Lloyd of the United States as champion of their prestigious tournament. 6-1, 6-2, Chris Everett Lloyd defeats Mima Yasevich. The Cardinals struck first for a run in the first. Here's Willie McGee with a hot shot singled in the left. Brett Butler comes up throwing, but it won't be in time to get Ken Obrick failed. 1-0 St. Louis. The Braves made short order of that lead in the second with one swing of the bat by Terry Harper. He rips this Joaquin Andahar pitch over the fence in deep center. It's a two-run blast putting Atlanta up 3-1. to one. But back came the cards in the fifth. Craig McMurtry serves up this long ball to George Hendrick. Butler will watch it sail over the left field fence, a two-run shot to tie the game at three. But in the sixth, the Braves would take the lead for good. Runners first and second. Here's Harper again with a hot shot pass short. Bob Horner will score from second, just ahead of Lonnie Smith's throw to third, nailing Chris Chambliss. It's the third out of the inning, but the run counts, and it's four to three Braves. They weren't through. In the seventh, Glenn Hubbard pounds this double just inside the right field line. As the ball rolls into the corner, two runners circle and score. That made it a 6-3 game, Atlanta. The Cards added one more in the eighth and threatened here in the ninth, but with runners on the corners and one out, Terry Forster gets Keith Hernandez to ground into this game-ending double play. Braves win it 6-4 and make it six straight over the defending world champions. Well, I'm just glad I'm out of school. I graduated uh, Friday, and I'm just glad to be out of school. Well, I plan to go to the United States Air Force Academy this summer, July the 20th, 20th, and major in electrical engineering. Going to Florida and going swimming in the beach. When you get when you when you get when you have a uh, get down beer bust and picnic. Yeah, you get married Friday. <laughs> yeah, that's on my mind. That's on my mind. Oh, lots of things. <laughs> like what? About feeling good. That's one. Feeling good. You know, I like three months of being 96 years old. <laughs> I'd like to know why you have to pick such pretty girls to come over here. We got, we, we got ugly girls. Our girls ain't pretty like y'all. <laughs> 